Hi, everybody. It's been a while. This is Jason. I'm your host here at Full Cast and Crew Podcast, and I apologize for the long delay of late between episodes. You know, we're all living in this pandemic and managing as best we can. For me, I've been fortunate enough that the production company where I work, Meeting House Productions, has been incredibly busy during these last six months. Hard to believe it's been six months of the pandemic. And so I haven't had as much time to record podcasts about entertainment that I love and appreciate and have been watching, although I have been diving into a number of series on streamers, which I want to try and find time over the next week or so to record these single, hopefully shorter episodes, just talking to you myself about some of these series, which have really become amongst, I think, the greatest I've ever seen anywhere on television and are worth sharing with you in case you, like me, were sort of unfamiliar with them prior to this pandemic and or have time now to perhaps enjoy the escapism of jumping into a deep and long running series that allows you to just escape from what the hell it is we're all living through during these very trying times. So First, let me just say thank you to everyone who's listening. Thank you to people who listen while you're working in your trucks or your cars and doing whatever you're doing. It means a lot to hear, even anecdotally, that that people find some time during the day to listen to my guests and I prattle on about movies and TV shows that uh, we love and appreciate. So we love and appreciate you as well. And the show I want to talk to you about today, I would say it's probably my favorite TV series of all time now, uh, and it's called The Bureau. You've probably seen me post innumerable posts about it on the show's Instagram account at Full Cast and Crew Podcast. This is a five season TV series from France produced and created by Eric Rochant. One of the pitfalls of doing this episode is I'm going to have to say a lot of French names. I apologize to our French listeners for the butchering that's about to occur. The Bureau has five seasons, which are all available to stream. Uh, at least here in America, and Amazon Prime is where you want to start. Now, we're in the category here of spy fiction. It's described as a French political thriller, and it takes place around the lives of agents of what's called the DGSE, or as you will no doubt be saying to yourself in your homes after you watch a season or two, the DGSE. You'll find yourself pronouncing a lot of funny French terms after this. My friend Paul Green, who did an episode of the podcast, <laughs> he he and I both dived down into this rabbit hole a little bit and we would text each other a lot of minutia about the series. And um, he, he, like I, found himself using all these French phrases in his daily American English conversations. So anyway, you know, if you're not into spy fiction, if you're not into political thrillers, I want to really encourage you not to be put off by this because like all great things, like all great movies, like all great TV shows, we can say that the Bureau is about what it's about. On the one hand, it is a French political thriller. It is a spy fiction drama, but like all things that are truly great, it's really about ourselves, life, and what's important to us and how we navigate importance, how we how we tier what's important in our daily lives, uh, the sacrifices that we make and the compromises we talk ourselves into and out of both for our work and for our love lives and for our personal lives. And grounded by just a lot of incredible recurring characters, uh, who we spend all this time with over five seasons. So I'm I'm fortunate enough to have just binged this over the last six months uh, and not had to wait five years for the episodes to unfold. So we have to remember how rare it is to have a show that keeps everyone together this way for so long. And one of the benefits of that for us is you really get to to know these characters not only in the office and around the work they do, for the General Directorate of External Security uh, and France's War on International Terror. But you get to know their personal lives, you get to know their families, you get to see them in a variety of different scenarios and locations. And I think that's the thing that elevates this, along with an essential Frenchness, which I want to talk about in a moment, from just your 
quote unquote, run of the mill spy fiction drama and really elevates it beyond almost any other TV series I've ever seen. It really makes so many things that we praise and hold up as great, which may be great on their own merits, kind of one dimensional. Some of this, I think, is the Europeanness of this, you know, living in the States and watching a lot of what I've been watching recently are these international streamed series. And I'm sorry, they're just generally vastly superior to the majority of things that we get made and produced here in the United States. That's probably not a shocker for anyone who doesn't live in the United States, right? Wait, you're telling me that American culture can be flat and one dimensional? You know, it's the rare series I see here in America that that I think is really worthy of the shows that I'm going to talk about over these next couple of episodes. Uh, the Bureau, Gomorra, 000. I would put Raimi in that category because that's sort of what kicked off this run of uh, streamed fictional series for me, which I don't usually watch a lot of, to be honest with you. You know, if I'm watching TV, I'm either watching a movie, a documentary, sports, that's it. I'm really not a guy who watches a lot of scripted series. So I'm the guy who hasn't seen anything that everybody talks about over the years. But back to the Bureau. So the Frenchness of the show, to me, is part of what makes it incredibly great. Now, in a sort of lightweight and analytical version of what I mean by that, I think that if you spend any time in France, and I have gone to France twice a year for the last 10 or 11 years for business and spent time there. And I, I, I love and appreciate the culture. And I also love and appreciate what's funny about essential quote unquote French culture, which in the States we sometimes refer to as a dismissiveness, you know, a sort of lack of concern, particularly towards you as an American, justifiably, understandably so granted. Uh, but you know, if, if you have some everyday concerns in a restaurant or what have you, there's a certain Gallic shrug that that gets commented on. And there's a certain elevation of a sybaritic lifestyle. You know, there's romance and drinking wine and strolling arm in arm and wearing perfectly coordinated clothing. You know, French, France, City of Lights, all this stuff. Now, given that we're talking about spy fiction and the lives of agents whose job it is to train deep undercover agents to go into life-threatening situations around the world. Here we have the typical spy fiction Petri dish from which everything is going to spring. And spy fiction for me, I'm a big mystery reader. I'm a big spy fiction reader. You know, for me, the Holy Grail, the, the, the person at the top of the pyramid um, is John le Carré because John le Carré's books, the great ones, and even the good ones, all contain one of, for me, the most essential aspects of spy fiction, which sets it apart from other types of mystery novels or police procedurals or any of the other types of things that I, that I like to read. And that is its romantic heart. It has an ennui. It has a beating heart. It's all about damaged people giving of themselves in service of something larger than themselves. And that thing that they believe they are serving inevitably comes back to try to compromise, kill, marginalize, sideline, what have you. And the broken nature of the people that find their way to this work is something that you're going to see over and over again if you read any of the great John le Carre novels or you've even seen any of the great adaptations the film adaptations of the John le Carre novels that are worth revisiting. And if you want to go down a little bit of a le Carre rabbit hole here, uh, I can give you a few to start with. Uh, the absolute top and the pinnacle to me is the original Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy series from the BBC in 1979, starring Alec Guinness as George Smiley. This is a slow, iconic television series of just unfathomable intelligence and emotional brilliance, even though the characters are so stilted and, and repressed and awkward. That's just a, a phenomenal series if you can find it. A great film adaptation is The Spy Who Came In From The Cold in 1965. Uh, maybe the best distillation of Le Carre ever put on the big screen. 
a wonderful Richard Burton performance. A great recent series I really enjoyed was The Night Manager. This one really gets at a lot of the themes that we're talking about in terms of the, the heart and the sentimentality and the betrayal and all the things that are going on. And it also stars the amazing and beautiful and talented Elizabeth Debicki. Uh, so The Night Manager is great. Uh, Smiley's People is a follow-up to Tinkle, Tinkle Taylor. Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. Alec Guinness returns. Just another wonderful slice of that specific era, uh, 1982 British filmmaking. You got the big like phones and all the kinds of stuff that I just love about that. Movie I really enjoyed, Constant Gardner, one of the best endings in a film. Brilliant, brilliant performance from Rachel Weiss. Uh, Ray Fiennes embodying this fractured heart of a Le Carre hero. Not sure how well the Kenya storyline hand sets up remains looking back on a 2005 film, uh, but very, very, very good movie. And another one that I really like a lot, uh, Taylor of Panama is a really fun, brilliantly acted film. Jeffrey Rush, Jamie Lee Curtis, Brendan Gleeson, a little very tiny Daniel Radcliffe makes an appearance and Pierce Brosnan at his best another great turn and Jeffrey Rush again is just a great Le Carre type central figure so if you're looking for more of this kind of stuff I would go there I would avoid things like the Russia house I would avoid the remake of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy unless you really like a terrible wig on Benedict Cumberbatch although there are good things about it it just it's you have no reason to watch that when the 1979 one is so freaking good so those are just a few Le Carre recommendations on the big and the little screens if you need them. You know, to me, that's the beating heart of spy fiction. That's what I like about it. And since we're talking about a French television production here, you have even more of that at the nature of these characters and the series. And so that's particularly why I think this elevates itself beyond just top shelf, really well produced spy fiction and drama because it has an essential Gallicness, an essential Frenchness, which actually fits hand in glove with spy fiction and drama uh, to begin with. So the Gallic nature of the characters, the inner conflict, the ways in which they seek love and release, the ways in which they navigate their personal lives and their professional lives, there's a certain Frenchness to this, which doesn't tick over into caricature uh you know people do not deliver long-winded speeches uh and you know smoke cigarettes in cafes while doing so um it's it's more that there's just something elemental i think both about the french nature and spy fiction that that really goes well together it's kind of the same reason why a lot of British spy fiction is so great as well, because in Britain you have, what do you have? You have sort of, you have some repressed, repressed stuff going on. You have people that don't necessarily emote every thought and feeling like Americans do. And so that means there's a very rich inner life, which doesn't always have to be externally explicated upon. And when you have actors, particularly in films and movie adaptations or TV series adaptations who are particularly adept at mirroring that type of emotion you really get some really interesting stuff because you're just you're getting people who have a lot going on internally without necessarily over emoting that externally and there's no greater example of that than really the lead character of the bureau uh malotru is his deep cover code nickname which i think means either lout or pain in the ass i think it's described in the series but his real name in the show is Guillaume Debaillé. Again, apologies for the horrible pronunciations. Guillaume is played by Matthew Kasovitz, who is an actor you've probably seen around a little bit. He's a director, a screenwriter, a producer, an actor. He's got a production company. He's a big deal in France and in international cinema. And Americans, typically, probably have never even heard of the guy. <laughs> uh, he's won Caesar Awards for acting. He is a guy who just is the perfect embodiment of this series in so many ways because of all of the things I just mentioned about the internal life and the external evocation of that inter internal life. 
but it's really his story that is the beating heart of all five seasons. And it's, and, and it's very simply put, it's the pull of a very real love affair that he has with a source and his need to protect and cover that up, which causes him to play many sides against the middle in an effort to have it all and an effort to do both his service to his country and what he believes is right. And those two things diverge, of course, as they often do in spy fiction. And then also there's this very real love story uh, between him and the main female protagonist who is really the other part of the beating heart of this series that, that runs through all five seasons, which is Zineb Triki playing Nadia El Mansour, who's a Syrian professor of history and a source that Debayi courts and then falls in love with during his six years undercover in Damascus. And it's really their relationship and also her involvement in the Syrian conflict that kind of set the series off in season one. And it's a lot of the fallout of those things that, that, that trips things through seasons two through five, which just concluded a few weeks ago. And there's a controversial ending, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So Matthew Kasovitz as Guillaume Debailly. He's really the guy you're going to be following through these seasons. And then we have a bunch of other major characters. We have Marina Loiseau, who is codenamed Phenomenon, uh, played by an extraordinary actress, Sarah Girardot, who is a seismologist and is sent undercover to intense places like Iran and has some of the more kind of... Um, excruciatingly tense scenes about undercover life and also some very moving scenes about juggling personal life, romantic life in the midst of that. One of the great characters is Henri Duflo, played by Jean-Pierre Daroussin. He's the director of the DGSE in the first three seasons, and he's kind of the dad of the Bureau, and he's someone at first who you're kind of He's not as flashy as everyone else. He's kind of balding. He has a beard. He wears particularly horrible ties for a very specific reason, which is a funny moment in the first season. But as you get to know him, you will come to count on his wisdom and his steely determinedness to do the right thing in difficult circumstances. And you'll be moved by some of the aspects of his home life, which you get to see. Then Marie Jean, I mean, Played by Florence, Lo again, terrible pronunciations, I apologize. Florence Loiret Kyle? Loret Kyle? Loret? I, who, God, I don't know. She's Marie Jean. That's all you need to know. She's the handler of Guillaume de Bailly, and she also handles Marina Loiseau after de Bailly comes back from Syria, and she eventually. Uh, takes on a greater role. I'm trying not to give too many spoilers in here so that some of this, but this is really not a spoilery type show. So if I say things that like she becomes the director of the Bureau, that's not, none of this stuff, none of the plot stuff is so shocking really until later seasons. So I'll, I'll stay away from some of that stuff, but I'm going to tell you some of the things about that happens to these people and you're really not going to, you're not going to gain or lose anything by knowing this. So Marie Jean is a great, great character. Um, again, such an amazing actor portraying her, underplaying her. All the acting is just so incredibly strong. That's the other thing that I've come to really appreciate about a lot of these series is, again, in America, you know, I think you tend to see a lot of the same actors, even character actors, in a lot of different shows because that's the way the business works. People become successful and, you know, they become a type and people want to hire that type. One of the great things about the streaming era that I've really been engaged with over the last four or five, six months is, I'm just coming to appreciate and experience so many actors from so many countries around the world that I really never would see without Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, all of these streamers, you know, to a lesser degree, HBO at all. But it's really this digital streamers and really Amazon Prime and Netflix that are really bringing the majority of these things to life in a way that business wise, they just would never work on American television as is because they are starting out trying to appeal to a globe, they're cast and they're set in locations that you have to actually be in and shoot in. And they have the money and the wherewithal to prioritize realism. And so you're really getting just phenomenal actors from all of these countries who are bringing this stuff to life. So Marie-Jean is an incredible character. 
an actor named Jonathan Zakai plays Raymond Sisteron. He's another kind of uh, beta male character who you'll who you'll follow through all five seasons. And, you know, he's kind of the office Lothario in a way that is a little bit amusing in French. One of my favorite characters is Sylvain Ellenstein, who is basically the IT guy, but in a manner that allows him to basically hack into any phone or computer anywhere around the world. Uh, and all this stuff is done with great realism. And, and I love the type of minutia and detail that goes into that stuff. So Sylvain Ellenstein is a great character played by Jules Sago. Who else is amazing? Uh, later seasons, you know, an actor you probably have seen in a lot of films, Matthew Almarek plays Jean-Jacques Angel. Gigi, Gigi, JJA. He is at first in charge of internal security and he's a snoop. He's the one who's got to find out the dirt on everyone that's doing the work and phenomenal actor and brilliant storyline that really comes uh, to fruition in seasons four and five. Who else do I want to make sure that I mention here? Oh, well, later on, Alexei Gorbunov, an incredible Russian actor, Mikhail Karlov, uh, seasons four and five. This man has the deepest cigarette voice I've ever heard in any film or TV series. This guy must smoke Jackie Gleason amounts of cigarettes per day. Jackie Gleason, in case you don't know, famously smoked five packs of cigarettes a day. That's 100 cigarettes a day. The only way that's possible is to wake up in the morning, light your first cigarette, light your next cigarette off that cigarette as you finish it, and so on and so forth until you go to sleep at the end of the day, in the end of the evening. Alexei Gorbanov, great actor, great character. I will talk a little bit about season five and the conclusion because I'm a little conflicted about the ending and particularly his ending. One of my other favorite characters is Le Mule, Daisy Bap, Daisy Bappé. That's the character name. Actress, Irina Mulieu. Uh, these are horrible. These pronunciations are terrible. <laughs> Somebody please correct me phonetically on Instagram after this episode comes out because it'll be hilarious to see how wrong I got these. But anyway, Lemuel is operational support. She does field surveys, sur field surveillance. She escorts the, the people from point A to point B to important meetings. She does logistics. But she is such an amazing presence throughout all seasons. And she has such baleful, watchful eyes. And she's probably one of the lower people on the totem pole, hence the nickname Lemuel, but she knows everything that's going on with everyone at all times. And she's actually one of the most important people in the DGSE and in your love and appreciation for this series, which I have no doubt that you will have. There's a lot of other characters here. I don't want to bog down in who's who, but just suffice it to say, you have several management types in the bureau. You have field agents. So you have that tension, of course, between the people who actually go out in the field and risk their lives and do the work. And then the people in the office who manage that work. You have competing factions within the bureau, people who have different agendas. You have political animals uh, like Mag, uh, Mulagoff, Colonel Mark Lauré, who is the boss of Henry Duflo and is the director of intelligence, a purely political animal. But a proud peacock type man, uh, but who also kind of comes through when needed and required. And so those are the basic players. And what else can I say about it other than you will not be disappointed if you stay with it. You know, it's yes, it's subtitled unless you speak and understand French and about five other languages that you'll hear throughout. So it does require your attention and it's not something you're going to put on and just tune out, you know, and zone out on. It's something that you're going to want to, you're going to want to, as we say, lean forward and participate in this series. But the pleasures of it and the, the brilliance of it and the music and the way it's produced and put together and the consistency over five seasons, that's the thing. You know, I can't sit here and say there's one season that really let me down except maybe the last season of a couple episodes and we'll talk about that in a second but man consistently all the way through there are interesting things that are going on and it does not have like a bad season like many series kind of end up having so the bureau or le bureau de légende in french again apologies for my horrific french pronunciation 
you're going to want to check this out. It's it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's the greatest television series I've ever seen. And I don't say that lightly. I'm not saying that to be provocative or, you know, have you at me. I'm just saying that consistently over time, this is a show that transcends its genre and really, I think, approaches art in terms of a TV series without being pretentiously artful or intentional. You know what I mean? It just it just is and does. It comes from such a pure place. And I think that's the control of, of Eric Rochon, the series creator, writer, director. You know, it it exists within the best example of what being a showrunner means in the business, which is someone has a vision and that vision is meticulously followed and how much work that implies. We've talked about that on the podcast before. And I think that's probably why Eric Rochant uh, at the end of season five realized, you know, he needed to step away from this for a little bit because that's a long time. That's a lot of your life. And I'm sure it's a 24 seven existence when you're in charge of something like this, that's as big as it is. It's filming all over the world. Now, if you do get through and you get to season five, or if you've seen the series and you've watched season five, you know, one of the big controversies that occurred was that after five seasons, Eric Rochant was ready to give someone else the total control over the last couple of episodes that he had had over the entire four and a half, four and three quarter seasons. So the person that he gave control of the season of the series to is French director Jacques Audiard. You'll probably know Jacques Audiard for films like The Beat That My Heart Skipped or A Prophet. Those are probably two of his better known films. Uh, he also made a film called Rust and Bone, which was up for the Palme d'Or at the 2012 Cannes Film Festival. So anyway, Jacques Audiard is totally a different type of writer and director than Eric Rochant is. And in some of the stuff I've read about sort of why he did this, why he turned it over, especially to someone who's basically new to television. I don't think Jacques Audiard directed any television prior to doing this. I think Eric Rochant kind of saw it as, you know, I guess you could get to this place and you don't really know how to bring things to a, to a close, maybe. You know, I mean, we put so much weight on final episodes of things. I think about here in the States, The Sopranos is such the such the alpha example of that, where you have this very inconclusive ending, which to me is absolutely brilliant. And I think the greatest ending of any TV series ever uh, because of its inconclusiveness. That's that's the only way it could have ended. And the mastery of that final scene of The Sopranos cut to journey. You, you have to just watch that again. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. If you haven't watched it recently, watch the entire sequence a few times and just appreciate how it's cut the music, the way the community, the, the visual language of that scene does not rely on dialogue whatsoever. It relies all on your awareness as a viewer of everything that came before and your awareness of Tony Soprano and the various threats that he faces and your awareness of the daily pressure of the oppressive nature of the uncertainty that he finds himself in given his chosen line of work. And so to me, that brilliant, brilliant ending, which I remember screaming at my television set, which I remember thinking, did the cable just go out? And, it, and to me, it's a brilliant ending because it gave you as a viewer that moment where you weren't sure what just happened. I literally thought the cable television cut out. That's how hard the cut to black is at the end of that episode. And only when you realize what was just done to you, do you go back and go, holy shit, my mind is blown. To me, it's a perfect ending of a television series. Now, when you get to the last two episodes of The Bureau, all of a sudden, the guy who built this entire incredibly complicated mechanism, he's not there anymore. He's not involved. <laughs> Jacques Audiard is involved, and guess what? You can do whatever you want, including power over life and death decisions about all these characters uh, that, that we knew. Here's a quote from Audiard. He said, uh, quote, there was a British guy named Terrell who built incredi incredible Formula One race cars. He said you had to tune up a good one in such a way that it would win the race and collapse right afterward. He laughs and added, and that's what I did. So Audiard is the kind of guy who takes a little glee in the fact that he's going to ruffle some feathers. I think he knows that going in. 
He knows that he has such an incredibly beloved creation and that it is sacrosanct. How dare you do anything to this thing? And that's, I think, sounds like Jacques Audiard enjoys the fact that he gets to stir up that pot a little bit. So the last two episodes are all under the control of Jacques Audiard, who's also said, I was interested in working with characters I didn't create on stories I wasn't familiar with. For me, it was about leaving behind the, quote, auteur filmmaker milieu with which I'm associated in France and in Europe, and I found that invigorating. So interestingly, you have kind of a director coming in to take charge of the last two episodes who kind of has his own agenda about his own career and is not really invested in these characters and in this world. And in a way, it gives you some freedom to do some things that I think the original creator and showrunner may not have the freedom to do just because, as I said, you're so involved and tied up with this thing that you created in these people's lives that you created. And how do you even bring it all to the appropriate conclusion? It's probably impossible to do. And in some sense, I think you could accuse Eric Rochon of basically abdicating responsibility for the world and just handing over the keys to an acclaimed director and saying, well, that, that was what he chose to do. So there's a little bit of that. And I was on board with this knowing it was coming and I was very interested to see what happened. And I would say that the first of the final two episodes I found more successful, but the last I still feel I'm unfulfilled. I'm unsatisfied. I don't think it really was. I think in some ways it was a fitting conclusion, at least to the Malatru story, to the Nadia Al-Mansur story in some ways. But it's not what they deserved. It's probably truthful to the real life scenarios that people like this find themselves in. But it's certainly not what you're going to have wanted as an audience member. And it it just fell flat. I don't think it worked. I think that the way that some of these storylines were tied up, some were just left dangling and hanging, which I think presumably there's a season six. And whether Rashant comes back or whether Audiard stays in, in touch with this, you know, we'll have to see if some of these threads get picked up. I've read some things that said that season six would be more of a prequel to the Malatru character and maybe follow more of his uh, undercover experiences because we don't really get a lot of that. Really, other than the first episode, he's coming out from undercover and that's how everything sort of sets off. So we didn't really get to see a lot of him doing what he presumably was the best at the world in. So I think that is part of perhaps where season six goes. Uh, but, ah, uh, I don't know. It didn't work for me, the final conclusion, which is not to put you off from watching it. I think it's just a further way to give testament to how emotionally engaged and involved I was with these characters and these storylines that you even have something to ruminate on and to kick around and to think over and to feel unsatisfied is still, in a way, its own kind of satisfaction because there are no easy conclusions to storylines like these. So, I can't say enough about the Bureau. I can't say enough about all these actors. I can't say enough about how enjoyable it will be for you to go on this journey and you have the ability uh, to binge it. So I would binge it discriminately. I would not stay up till four o'clock in the morning. I don't, please don't do four or five episodes in a row and lose some of your appreciation. It's really best just watch one or two a night and get into that kind of vibe because you can follow it. You can have your attention. Are there cliffhangers at the end of episodes? Yes, but you can also put the remote down and just absorb and just sit with it. it. It's a moment to not be in our limited attention span theater world that we're in, information rushing at us on the internet and in our ears and on our screens and on our phones and on the, on the TV. Uh, just, if you can, binge it responsibly, okay? And I think you'll enjoy it. The Bureau, Amazon Prime. Get started if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it, uh, please keep listening because I will be talking in our next episode about Gamora, which is right up there as well with my favorite television series of all time and similarly something that has run for uh, numerous seasons. I've only so far been able to watch the first two seasons, but I'm going to be watching seasons three and four shortly. Uh, once my internationally cracked DVD player allows me to play the DVDs, which I had to purchase uh, from Europe in order to watch the, the, the available remaining seasons. So if you haven't seen the Bureau, jump in, check it out. I think you're going to love it. Thanks for listening. We will have guests coming back soon as we get back into life here in September and October. 
Uh, we'll continue with the Zoom guests, some familiar faces, maybe some new guests will be stopping by. So again, thank you so much for listening. And that's my phone. So that means it's time for me to go back to work. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.